forty. Uh, sorry, ten forty. Otherwise, Thank you. Richie would be gone. <laughs> yes, I, yes. I. <laughs> he's he's not actually here. <laughs> Good. You uh, like the field trip, though. Oh, the field trip. Yes. The we field are trip live. Represents our committee perfectly. <laughs> We have we've not had one just lately, so um, that is something that was a plus each time we had one. Since we're not online, <laughs> uh, um, it is. Um, we, uh, are well, we, like we are online. We are live. We are. We are live. Now right, we are. I'm not going to say what I'm going to say. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jude. Keeping an eye on us. All right. So uh, it's it's ten forty one. So let's recommence and um, like to um, next welcome Mr. McNamara back to committee. Good morning. So uh, you've, you've heard a lot of a wide ranging discussion and um, people have latched on to different parts of the overall uh, set of questions that went out, but it you know, just for refocusing, I think we've laid out three things. One, there's a bill in front of us just as a starting point for a conversation. And then there was a series of questions related to how would you define Vermont's renewable energy challenge? And how do we look at being sort of, I guess, smart about planning for where we wanna be in five and 10 and 15 years. Um, and we've certainly heard competing uh, analyses so far. So love to hear from the department. Uh, what, how you're looking at all this work. And it, I'd also go back to Senator McDonald's practical questions, you know, one of which is how do we keep the, the sun on at night? Um, and how do we make it, let me go back so I get it right. Uh, how do we, number two was, how do we make it, uh, I think, easier for people who are, how do we reduce line losses? Well, I'll leave it at that, those, those two. Senator McDonald will add as we go. Um, so good morning, Mr. McNamara. Thanks for coming back in and thanks for your patience coming back a second uh, for day two. Good morning, thank you for the invitation. I'm gonna share my screen here. I did prepare some slides and apologies for being a little slow on this. Um, Just let me know once that pops up. Yes, sir. It is, okay. Um, great. <clears throat> so most of this is gonna be focused on energy challenges and the very last slide touches quickly on um, S119. It seems that this is much more wide ranging discussion at this point. So I'm gonna start with some basics, some basic information here. So there's 400 megawatts of distributed solar in Vermont. There's additionally 450 seg 456 megawatts, apologies, of additional in-state generation. Um, some of this is, as Mr. Bender pointed out, you know, from the 1880s, some of the hydro facilities still producing power. <clears throat> A large portion of this is from the 2005 speed program that basically told the utilities go out and either build or enter into long-term contracts with specific resources. Um, another important point, so Vermont's roughly 4% of the New England load, and ISO New England every year looks at how much distributed generation is on the system, assigns it by state, or sorry, looks at it per each state. So um, Vermont has about 10% of the region's distributed solar. No other state comes close to that in terms of percentage of load share. <clears throat> so Vermont's policies have definitely um, promoted a lot of small scale solar. Next bullet point, $85 million paid to distributed solar in Vermont in 2019. Those are gross costs. That's not trying to do a cost benefit analysis. I put that in there in part because you heard last week that there was a certain amount of um, benefits associated with distributed solar. 
it's worth taking a look at that report for yourselves, take, uh, do a review of it. You can see that those benefits are gross benefits and not net benefits. The report that was prepared um, for Renewable Energy Vermont was not designed to be a cost benefit analysis, simply designed to quantify benefits. Provide an interesting data point, does not provide a full picture. So just putting that in there to provide some context of what the costs are compared to some of the benefits. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, can, can we yep. pause on that bullet just for a moment? Um, so thanks for pointing it out because we're always trying to talk about the, a holistic picture in here and make sure that we're not just looking at a slice that's either, either favorable or disfavorable to a particular view. And so the number I'm used to hearing from uh, Green Mountain Power, which is whatever, three quarters of our load or so, is that they, I think, typically assess something like a $35 million annual rate impact to the increased cost, at least in their perspective, of buying net meter uh, generated power over the market, comparable market power. And um, so 35 uh, is a lot less than 85. So can you say a little bit, I'm, I'm actually a little surprised to see that figure. So I wonder if you could just, uh, you know, if, tell us how you get there a little bit. Yep. Um, so again, this is gross cost. This is not rate pressure. This is not any anything else other than the department looking at what was paid to each resource, each distributed solar resource in 2019. Um, we did this back in January, which is why I still have 2019 data instead of 2020 data. But it's essentially, we looked at each category of um, renewable, or sorry, net metering. We looked at the, some utilities have uh, power purchase agreements directly with some um, small scale, sorry, distributed solar facilities. And also the standard offer prices are, you know, on the standard offer facilitators website. And so we went through those, consolidated all those and looked at, here's how much in gross that we paid <clears throat> to these resources. There's different ways of calculating the benefits associated with that $85 million. I'm definitely 100% not saying that the $85 million is a cost shift. Um, simply noting that as a data point, basically in some way as a response to the slide that you saw last week, which is, I think it was $79 million in benefits from distributed solar from 2015 to 2019 through 2019, I believe. Okay. Um, so this is, this isn't, uh, it's silent on whether this is uh, a high or low expenditure. It's just that that's the gross revenues paid to purchase the in-state distributed generation from solar. Got it. That's correct. Thank you. Um, next point does start getting at that a little bit. Um, distributed solar produced about 10% of the energy, not renewable energy, the actual kilowatt hours in Vermont in 2020. Um, the 2021 tier two requirement is 3.4% the vast majority of that is being met with solar. And looking at power supply costs, um, this 10% of the energy is roughly 20% of the power supply costs for Green Mountain Power. It's higher for Washington Electric Co-op. It will be higher because each utility, this is a statewide estimate, each utility has various amounts of net metering and other resources. <clears throat> This data also represents that this is this reflects prices paid over the last 10 years. So standard offer in 2009 was 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, net metering was 20 cents up until relatively recently as well. So these costs are coming down over time. And I will just touch on, um, since Chairman Bray, you asked, it seems like you're getting to the question about cost shift. And I will say 
the way that the department looks at that issue is roughly three quarters of the amount of net metered production is exported directly to the grid, not used on site. And so that is being compensated right now at um, 15, 16 cents a kilowatt hour. Other resources, solar resources, new, new solar facilities are being paid less than nine cents a kilowatt hour. And so that's what, when I say cost shift, when I talk about a cost shift, it's simply 15 cents is greater than nine cents. It's pretty simple. Excuse me. Yep. Mr. 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 Chair. McDonald. Um, yes, sir. When we are comparing the so much an hour for solar versus so much an hour for not solar, are you counting it 24 hours a day or are you counting it during the hours that solar produces versus the cost that you would have to pay for um, peak power? And just to be clear, I'm comparing 16 cent solar to nine cent solar. There's a fair number of projects. So I'm not, I'm not doing what you're saying. I'm Thank you. comparing Thank directly you. apples to apples. Thank you, my error, my error. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So that's the basics of when we talk about cost shift, it's simply that the difference between what we can obtain through larger scale projects compared to the small scale projects on a per KWH basis. <clears throat> so <clears throat> next couple of slides is going to be about sort of um, my perspective on Vermont's energy challenges. First and most important, address the climate crisis. How do we do that? Second is there's shifting expectations regarding distributed generation. Actually, I'm gonna skip this slide because I talk about each of these in subsequent slides and I know that you're short in time. Um, energy and the climate crisis. Three quarters of Vermont's GHG emissions are from transportation and thermal sectors. There's definitely um, questions about additionality. I understand what Mr. Bender is saying, what Mr. Walsh is saying. <clears throat> and it's not an illegitimate question. Regardless of that, most of our effort needs to go to transportation and thermal. Electrification is how we're going to get most of those GHG emission reductions. And Vermonters need to be better off economically if they switch to heat pumps and switch to electric vehicles. There's some areas of the state where right now you actually pay more money if you switch from um, heating fuel to a heat pump. And so there's already significant cost pressure on the electric sector. How do you minimize that cost pressure to ensure that folks have greater incentive to switch to EVs and to heat pumps? Shifting expectations regarding distributed generation. So back in 2005, I was at the Public Utility Commission I worked on the Northwest Reliability Project transmission line where the PUC said, Velco, if you had done a better job looking at distributed generation and energy efficiency, maybe we didn't need to build this line. That prompted a lot of um, policy infrastructure that was then created. And the expectation in 2005 is that DG, it's okay to pay distributed generation more because it has the benefit of deferring or obviating the need for transmission and distribution infrastructure. Fast forward 16 years, now a large portion of our grid is getting to the point where distributed solar is actually pushing um, TND or putting stress on the TND system. And so now instead of prioritize DG to defer or obviate the need for TND, it's now we should upgrade TND infrastructure or pay for storage to allow additional distributed generation. It's a significant shift from where we were 16 years ago, and I think it's worth noting that that's the shift. And just being really clear, do we still have that expectations regarding distributed generation? Yep. Senator, Senator McDonald. 
the expectation regarding distributed generation from the um, thank you for referencing the, the PUC's report. Um, what was it, page 1200 of that document that was, we would never, wouldn't be spending all the money on this transmission if we had done, um, if, if we had thought out ahead of time how to avoid, how to avoid it, um, which is really what jump started um, Efficiency Vermont. So how do we apply that same reason? logic to um, jump starting the next step in our um, movement from fossil fuels to uh, renewables? And that's a great question. I think one of them is, do we prioritize distributed generation because it is intrinsically good and therefore we're willing to pay more for it, including upgrading T&D infrastructure or paying for storage and or paying for storage actually? Or um, do we start looking at maybe sending power across the transmission lines that we've already paid for is actually a lower cost option? The, okay, I guess it, at that point, we would ask sending power across the lines we've already paid for, is that power coming in that's renewable or not renewable um, to start with? It was your proposal to be, or question to be agnostic to its source? Um, we definitely need to move towards all 100% clean, renewable, whichever term Massachusetts uses clean, Connecticut uses clean, we use renewable. We need GHG free generation. That's what we need to get to. That's where the entire region is getting to. And so offshore wind in off of the coast of Massachusetts, maybe that's actually less expensive than a solar project in Vermont. And should we say, and this actually gets to, if you'll indulge me for a second, this gets to the next point. Least cost planning is what we've had as a bedrock principle for decades. Meet GHG reductions, renewable energy requirements, maintain reliability, all at the lowest cost. A large portion of that is looking at, we've had over 50 years, over 60 years, <clears throat> excuse me, of regional coordination in the New England grid, helping build out the transmission grid, helping ensure that we actually have enough generation to meet load reliably. Do we continue down that path? The other extreme, which I'm recognizing is not, it's not an either or question, the other is you can take sort of the Vermont first approach, prioritize the in-state energy development and have minimal consideration of the cost. Say it's actually worth it because we want the generation in Vermont, even if it's more expensive. There's not a lot of clarity right now on that. My perspective statute is still, my job is to meet least cost planning principles. That's part of my role as planning director for Department of Public Service. And if that, the legislature wants to switch that and say, no, we're willing to pay more for in-state renewables, I think that should be explicit. There already is that requirement for tier two, where it's essentially a floor. I know it's been referred to as basically a ceiling, but it's a floor of the amount of in-state renewable that needs to be purchased. There's no ceiling on that. It's just that in-state small scale renewables is not cost competitive with larger scale renewables. Um, Mr. Chair, the, the, the witness's testimony has been very helpful because it helps us to show you know, what, what we've been operating under for many years, which is the least cost planning model or template. And for those of us that uh, have always sought to move to renewables, um, renewables turned out to be for several years um, and solar, um, the least cost um, alternative because they filled up the and lowered the price of peak demand, which was a very high cost. And for when when we, I say collectively we, would go out and argue that uh, the renewables was good because it reduced people's electric bills and helped bring them down and make Vermont more competitive, then we would also shrug at the end of our economic 
discussion and say, and if it's good for the environment, well, then the environment's just going to have to accept that it's a more renewable. But now what's changed is we're in a period when renewables cost more and different types of renewables cost more. How do we proceed that, that getting more renewables is more important? Um, is, it's become a priority as opposed to a, a kind of a free rider that's, that's ridden on be, that, it, that was embraced because it was lower cost, the least cost alternative. How do we make that change? Or do we just say um, no? Or what, what, or what signal do we have to send to the PUC and to, uh, to get what we're seeking? And so Senator McDonald, I would um, just I want to make really clear, least cost planning of meeting GHG requirements at the lowest cost. I am not saying we should be building coal plants. I'm not saying we should be subsidizing natural gas. We need to move to more renewables, more clean energy. How do you do that at the lowest cost? So just to be clear. Oh, oh thank you. Um, that, that was, you needed to make that point because... It was unclear. My okay. fault. Yeah. All right. My apologies. And you, no, 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 we're, <laughs> no one needs to apologize. We're stumbling in the, in the, trying to all stumble in the same direction here. Um, right. So yeah. you're going to, you're going to, and you, you're suggesting uh, um, if it's offshore wind from Massachusetts, then how would we accommodate that? Or, and then we'll argue. Okay. We'll listen. Yep, I will get there eventually. I've got your three questions written down. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, I just want to thank you for the, the clarity slide because when we're not clear about definitions and then underneath, definition seems so wonky. We don't sometimes spend enough time there, but the definitions that drive the, the, th the choices we make downstream of the definition. So, yep. you know, one of the things I'm wondering about is the reliability is being, how we talk about that now seems to be sort of merging into the term resilience um, in the face of climate change. And, and so islanding, and so what we mean by reliability seems to be in flux as well. Yep, and I have a slide or two on um, resilience in particular that I'll get to. Okay. <clears throat> So um, another concern or a challenge is shifting burden of risk. So if you have the greater specificity in terms of the products that you want, um, the quantities that you want, that actually tends to increase the costs and erodes lease cost principles. It also, I would argue, locks in business models and limits innovation. And what I'm thinking here is, for example, when um, iPhone sales started plateauing, Apple did not go around asking to mandate iPhone sales. They instead went and said, we're going to develop an entire division of our company that's dedicated to services, Apple Music, Apple TV, Apple Fitness, additional products such, such as Apple Watch. That's an innovative approach. And so, um, really liked what Mr. Bender was saying about when he's in a home installing solar, look at help them with the EVs, help them with heat pumps. And I would actually add that you can set up a policy and we've recommended this as a discussion point on net metering compensation where you provide greater compensation for what you produce and use on site. What you export to the grid is compensated significantly less that then creates business opportunities for companies to go into somebody's house and say, I can do storage. I can set up a timer on your EV charging. I can set up something on your heat pump. Here's if you insulate, here's how to keep um, heat latency so that your heat pump can operate throughout the night if you preheat to some degree in the middle of the day. There's business opportunities that we can have simply saying, here's the existing business model um, let's have additional products that are mandated for Vermonters to buy is not 
not particularly innovative going forward. <clears throat> This next bullet, um, <clears throat> to what extent should Vermonters be minimizing the economic risk of unregulated for-profit companies? And I don't say that as sort of a negative term, um, just clear recognition that merchant companies, um, merchant generators, any company is going to have, there's very little limits right now on the upside of profitability of installing devices, doing things like that. However, there tends to be this reaction of we need to have a base level compensation to ensure that these things get built, these specific products, these specific devices get built. And so Vermonters are paying for the low side risk, taking the risk off of companies and not actually getting much benefit on the high side as well. Uh, Mr. Bender talked a little bit about consumer choice. Uh, there's also a discussion, I think I heard the phrase last week, democratization of Vermont energy. <clears throat> and completely agree, all Vermonters should have the right to net meter. All Vermonters should have the right to be able to reduce their electric load, um, to install efficiency measures. That does not mean that all that there is a concomitant obligation to have all Vermonters pay for that. So if there is actually a cost shift, which the department believes in net metering, um, that's an issue. If a customer wants to net meter and nobody else is helping pay for that net metering facility, that's great. Fully support that. And this is one where I know a couple of utilities have raised concerns about declining sales. Um, that's a customer choice as to how much they want to be purchasing. If those sales, these, of, sales of electricity, um, yes, yeah, some folks have definitely said that net metering results in a decline in retail sales of kilowatt hours, which it does, and that that's a, that's a cost. I agree that that's a cost, and that customer still has the right to install a net metering project and disconnect from the grid to a large extent. That said, other customers of that electric utility should not be subsidizing that net metering project. That's the cost concern that we have, not the reduced kilowatt hour sales. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one way of getting around this, if you want to truly democratize like radical democracy, set the broad parameters of renewability say we want this much GHG reduction um, and then let the utilities meet those requirements at least cost, whether that's offshore wind, other different mechanisms. And then also require the utilities to offer voluntary adders for local attributes to the extent that those local attributes are not least cost. Basically provide transparency about the costs and let Vermonters vote with their wallet. And this idea is essentially um, I'm not sure if it's exactly farm to plate, but the local food movement in the agricultural sector, there's no mandate that people buy local agriculture. People voluntarily do it. If you go to the co-op in Montpelier, I've definitely seen times when local garlic is, or garlic from a local farm is three times as much as organic garlic from California or something like that. Customers then get to decide which one they opt for. And so if you really want um, radical dem democratization of Vermont energy, let Vermonters decide that. Set bare minimum requirements on renewable energy and GHG reductions. And then to the extent that folks want to voluntarily pay for more than that, let them do that. Um, there was, is that akin to how, uh, cow power at the beginning that was sign up for, uh, locally generated quote unquote clean energy and pay a voluntary premium when CVPS launched that, I think, right. I don't know if cow power still exists as a voluntary program. Um, my understanding is it does still exist. If it has gone away, it's very recent and I'm not aware of it. The main issue with cow power is that because net metering is so financially attractive, people moved to that uh -huh. and instead moved away from the cow power approach. 
And my argument is that with the cost shift of net metering, um, folks should be instead steered towards if you want to pay more for local, do it through voluntary mechanisms. Don't make all Vermonters pay for people to choose to self generate. Senator McDonald. Um, so the, the alternative for people that are net metering, um, and if you don't want others to pay for that, um, if, we, if we're opposed to using fossil fuels and we say, well, okay, we will, our policy is no longer to purchase fuels from uh, fossil fuels. Um, and we got rid of natural gas um, because that was a societal goal, then wouldn't, wouldn't the whole mathematics and making different people pay for net metering be altered somehow? Um, or is it only that net metering costs more because natural gas is cheaper as opposed to it would costing more um, how does the how does allowing fossil fuels to compete and operate um, affect this discussion we're having about who should be responsible or how should folks be credited for making renewable electricity and this is again there is uh, what I'm envisioning is that there is no, it's essentially a choice between are we doing nine cent solar power, eight cent offshore wind, or 16 cent net metering, not five cent natural gas. So it's trying to do as apples to apples a comparison as possible. Which you've done, you've you been very helpful in having us see that comparison as being a, an issue here. Um, I'm, I guess I was asking how do we compare, which is a society question, the use of fossil fuels with the use of renewables as a cost question, which is a different question. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I'm not trying to um, waste time here, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. The testimony is coming in. It's helping to put it in categories that are apples to apples or not apples to apples. And the witnesses has been straightforward about that. So, yep. And I would just say that um, yeah, renewables can cost more than natural gas, and it is a societal imperative that we shift off of fossil fuels. So then it's just a question of which renewables are we paying more for? Then it becomes a cost comparison among the renewables. So, but yet the utilities are free to, or to purchase electricity at the lowest possible cost, whether it's fossil fuel or not, there's no, is there any, there's no comp, there's, there's it's the cheapest fuel is the, um, has a kind of a, in absence of our prohibiting it, the cheapest fuel is, is um, has a monopoly on low costs, does it not? Yep, and I would just, um, maybe I need to do a better job writing this. So what I have in the second bullet here, set broad parameters for renewability that meets GHG reduction requirements. Let utilities meet these requirements. In other words, make sure that the utilities are meeting the GHG reduction requirements at least cost. Not trying to introduce any fossil fuel component into this. Are we make, making, making um, meeting fossil fuel reduction requirements today? It's a good question, and I would suggest having a longer discussion about the additionality piece, um, Hydro-Quebec, and other issues about renewability. Uh, that's We can definitely go down that rabbit hole right now. I'd suggest doing that as a separate 
discussion? Um, I, I, if that makes sense, Mr. Chair, and I'm, I'm feeling stupid, but please define an additionality. Um, we've heard that several times today so that our viewers know what we're talking about when we talk about additionality. Yep. And, um, and me, I'm not, I'm, I'm one of the viewers. <laughs> Um, so additionality is, uh, is a term that we've used. It's been used a lot in uh, REGI, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, other initiatives as well. And it essentially means that what you're doing is adding additional products of something that you like. And so <clears throat> ensuring that something is new is a different way of putting it. It's, uh, mm -hmm. It's definitely not the, I'm not providing the economic definition. I'm providing more that my understanding of how we have typically thought of additionality in the Reggie context is um, preserving a forest. If you already, if a forest is a state forest, there's no additionality. You can't have carbon offsets for the sequestration associated with that forest because you're not going to, or a state park because you're not going to cut it down you would need to actually take a, a new parcel of forest and say, we're setting up a res uh, easement restrictions to ensure that this forest is managed to actually sequester carbon. And so that's an additionality component. And it looks like I'm struggling here on this one. Oh, no, it's uh, a tough one. It's a tough one. No, um, yeah, you <laughs> Struggle is heads us in the right direction. Was that similar to your example about Apple um, switching from getting more iPhones to providing uh, additional services? Was that was that a, an example of additionality? Uh, no. Okay. Well, I'm no. Still, I'm struggling there. So, so I'm sorry. It may be a different way of putting it. Is um, if there's an existing hydro facility, that's not adding new renewable generation. A new solar project, a new wind project is additional renewable generation. That's the additionality component. That's a more, it's an easier way of trying to explain it. Okay. So the existing hydro does not add any new additionality. It doesn't help move forward on the progress. It helps maintain the progress or prior past progress. And Thank you. If, if it is were easy, we wouldn't be struggling with it. Thank you. Right. My sense so far has been that um, if we just, for instance, in the case of existing hydro, so Mr. McNamara, please check this out and make sure I'm not misthinking about it. If you just change who receives the power from a particular hydro facility, you don't solve the climate challenge. It's just who's getting that pre-existing clean power. What we need is more clean power on the grid period. And the new clean power is the, the additional clean power. Is that the additionality we're talking about? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Given the and fact that we say... argue over cleanliness of hydro, but if we're just talking about hydro, don't get into its cleanliness or we, it's another rabbit hole. Okay. Yeah. That's another rabbit hole, yeah. <clears throat> And I will say that the um, pretty much every state has what's called a maintenance tier or existing tier, and that's to ensure that we don't backslide on renewable projects that we've already built. So if a project, um, if a hydro project was constructed 30 years ago, we don't want that to go away. And so it doesn't need the same amount of new funding of um, rec value as a new solar project, which needs a lot of new capital costs to get built, but it might need some additional funding to ensure that it can keep operating. So that's one additional wrinkle as well that to add in there, because it was getting too simple for a second. So, <laughs> <laughs> so another challenge that we have is um, Vermont's antiquated distributed generation policy. <sighs> Small scale generation, um, right now there's really no incentive to co-locate or very minimal incentive to co-locate generation with load. Like I said before, three quarters of net metering exported directly to the grid. So what we need is dynamic pricing. We need to encourage location 
of energy uses and sources. We need to think about what the grid impacts are of new generation and provide the right price signal. Send generation to um, southern part of Vermont, which is relatively congestion free from a solar perspective. We need to time energy use and sources. And this is looking at, I guess I'll just touch really briefly on Senator McDonald's question of how do you make the sunshine at night? <clears throat> I would say that there's three different avenues to do that. Um, the first is to actually move the load. So the EV charging can take place during the daytime, set up workplace charging, provide incentives to actually have to ensure that people are charging their EV at the workplace when the, when the sun is shining, use up the solar when it's being produced. There's definitely costs in shifting load um, you know, for the control infrastructure, but it's quite hopefully likely that that's the lowest cost solution. Another is that you don't look at solar as the only generation option. You look at offshore wind, which actually has a significantly higher capacity factor. It's much more likely to produce energy in the winter time when we're running our heat pumps and EVs. So instead of overbuilding solar and storage just to meet EV needs in Vermont, import some offshore wind or other, other renewable energy that's being produced at the time that we need it. <clears throat> and then, of course, storage. Storage is useful. Um, right now, it's primarily short duration. So you can basically store it for four hours, release it. That can definitely help um, as well. But it is not the only option for making the sun shine at night. Overall, where we need to get to, we need to choreograph load and generation. That's an innovative grid. That is timing our intermittent generation with our load and looking at what types of gener how does what types of generation do we need? What types of load do we need? And how do you marry them up to the extent possible okay. at the lowest cost? When uh, we received era money, and then after that, I think there was the Scandia Labs money. I, I'm forgetting the different projects, but Vermont became, I thought, a uh, kind of a test site as a statewide level for a quote unquote smart grid. So I don't know how much smarter our grid got and how much progress it made towards becoming this sort of dynamic tool that you're talking about and how much more uh, smart and dynamic it needs to get. Can you say something about where, how much smarter we got and how much smarter we need to get? Yep. So um, I think there's a couple different components in there. So what you're referring to about 10 years ago, uh, Vermont received, I think it was $69 million from Department of Energy for uh, smart meters. And it was very specifically for smart meters. Those are very helpful in understanding the timing of load instead of just you know a dial spinning and you don't exactly know when it was spinning and when it wasn't unless you're staring at it. We actually have data on 15 minute increments of what's the load here versus this time versus this time. That's, so that actually provides a fair amount of information. It helps understand where we need to choreograph what loads happen when. However, it did not provide full smart grid capability in the way a lot of us think about it, which is the, these smart meters are not able to um, send signals to control load. Sorry, I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, I'll just, Green Mountain Power has a EV load control program where you get a lower rate if you let GMP control your charging. You know, you can opt out at any time, but you pay a higher rate. So GMP is not using their smart meters to actually control that. They're using the customer's um, broadband to control that. Okay. The Wi-Fi cap capability, I thought the Wi-Fi and smart meters was really like Wi-Fi times two. Wi-Fi mesh to report mm -hmm. to out your usage, whether you're there or not, disconnects and all that stuff. Uh, but then it also had a, uh, a local broadcast that it could talk to devices in the home. And then we would hear about sort of silly applications like, it, do I need more milk? 
uh, or whatever, that kind of smart appliance stuff, but turning water heaters on and off, did we not take advantage of the Wi-Fi to home device capacity of those meters? And is, is that not materialized? I remember hearing about that capacity. So my understanding is that has not materialized, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'd suggest having somebody from Green Mountain Power, um, Patty Richards from Washington Electric Co-op can also speak to that as well. She's, yeah. that's more of a hands-on issue than I have familiarity with. There might be, I'm sure there's some folks on my staff who understand that better than I do, but um, can't give you much more than that for right now. All right, thank you. So last point here, um, things are happening really fast. So technology is changing, markets changing. The more specific a policy that you put into place, the faster it becomes out of date. And so having some broad parameters about this is what we want, that is a better policy than we want this in particular. Say that again, please. So this gets to, um, I might have a bullet on this later. Essentially don't mandate products, you mandate characteristics. We want these characteristics. So in other words, don't mandate storage to make the sun shine at night. Say, figure out how to reduce the load or how to choreograph load and generation after solar um, stops producing. And that gets to what I was talking about before. There's at least three different options. You can use storage. You can also control load. You can also just say, we're actually going to skip this, the solar for these hours and import offshore wind. So that's what I mean by instead of saying we want storage because that's the only means of getting there, say we want to be able to minimize our electric vehicle load after dark. That would be a broad policy. Is that helpful? Yes. We're going to Great. still say uh, make the sun shine at night because it's a lot shorter and, and, and people you know think we're crazy and then maybe pursue what it means. Thanks. <laughs> no agree. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, another issue too is um, I've definitely been involved in setting administratively set prices, um, both in standard offer, net metering, and others. And whenever you have administratively set prices, instead of using a market to help set prices, it's not dynamic. It's not a. Uh, it's not going to capture decline in costs. So I pulled this from um, National Renewable Energy Lab. Every year they track. This is nationwide. What are the installed costs of solar? And so you can see that this is declined. Um, on the left is residential. What they call commercial is. I can't even read that. Um, roughly 200 kilowatts. So. There, what NREL has looked at in the surveys they've conducted, and uh, Mr. Farrell touched on this as well. Mr. Farrell's numbers are actually more aggressive than what I'd heard. 60% decline in PV installed costs over the last 10 years. So here's net metering rates. This is actually by net metering program, net metering 1.0, 2.1, you know, et cetera. <clears throat> but over the same 10 year period, while installed solar costs declined by 60%, net metering rates declined by 13%. So there's not the same sort of dynamic mechanism of capturing declining costs. I just wanna to touch briefly on storage mandates. Uh, first, Ann Margolis from our office uh, I think it was four years ago now. Um, yep, four, almost four years ago. Did a report on deploying storage, including whether or not to actually impose storage mandates. 
And this is the point that I was making before. You set the policy based on what Vermonters need, not what devices the companies want to sell. So need is for characteristics. Again, this gets to control load, um, uh, potentially purchase from out of state, you know, for the kilowatt hours that you need at certain times. You don't set a policy saying we want X device. That's almost always going to lead to higher costs. Uh, this next bullet point is just about flexible load management. I've already touched on that. Um, the last point on storage, <clears throat> individual storage power walls can definitely provide benefit to customers. Power walls also provide some benefit to all utility customers um, by reducing peak costs. And the power walls, and this is department and GMP litigated this before the PUC, um, I think about two years ago, power well, power well, excuse me, power wall costs, um, all Vermonters should only pay for that portion of the power wall costs that actually provides benefit to all Vermonters, the peak load reduction savings should not be paying for individual reliability for those folks who can af afford to install individual batteries in their homes. That's a separate thing that individuals can value for themselves. They can decide whether or not to install storage for that particular component. Vermonters should pay for the peak reduction to the extent that that individual storage is providing value to all Vermonters, but definitely not to the, in to the individual recipient of that local reliability benefit or individual reliability benefit. <clears throat> so um, Chairman Bray referenced resilience and re re reliability. Uh, resilience is definitely the buzzword in the ener energy industry it has been for the last two years and there's not a lot of definition to it. So I found what Department of Energy came up with and when you look at this, it's basically ability to prepare for, adapt to changing conditions, withstand, recover rapidly from disruptions. That's the essence of resilience. A single device does not provide resilience. And actually, if you just bear with me as I get through this next one, my background before I started in energy was um, environmental science, focus on ecology. So I think of resilience from ecological perspective, which is more resilient, 100 acre forest, diverse number of species, or an apple orchard that's a one acre, that's one acre. Every single ecologist is going to say 100 acre forest with diverse species. So <clears throat> the analogy I would use then is the New England grid, significantly larger footprint, larger number of resources, diversity of resources is always going to be resilient than just relying on one or two types of generation in state and adding storage. Relying on the New England grid and also having um, resilience islands, which is an issue that we've been talking about with Vermont emergency management. This is um, Panton microgrid, this is other areas where you essentially have a warming shelter in the wintertime and ensure that that area is rock solid and will always have electric power because you have enough storage there to back it up in the event. You have um, local generation to power that storage as well. That's going to provide significantly more benefit to Vermonters. And this is targeted towards ensuring a resilience for Vermonters. If there's a long duration outage, Vermonters need to be able to go somewhere where they can stay warm, where they can, uh, when we have all electric ambulances, they're gonna need to power up to make sure people can get to the hospital. This is what we need. This is what we mean by resilience. Resilience is a, it's a much more comprehensive issue than individual devices. And so when you hear resilience referring to, well, storage provides resilience, uh, not, not usually. It helps provide some level of increased reliability for that particular location and can be part of a more resilient infrastructure. But storage in and of itself is not 
necessarily resilience. Any questions on that before I move on? Great. <laughs> so um, that was the overview of perspective on energy challenges, very specific comments on S119. Honestly, I did not spend much time on the specific comments because there seemed to be much more of an interest in the broader discussion. <clears throat> um, and, overall, and that's, concept, that's, yeah. and that's totally fine because really 119 is the conversation starter and it captures, it reflects some of the conversation we've had, but the conversation's been a lot broader and rich and richer than, than what's in the bill. Thanks. Great. And so it's just some very specific high level comments. Um, underlying concept, essentially using avoided cost, and I'll touch on that for a second, um, as the base rate for virtual net metering, I think actually makes sense. I would, I would change this so that it completely replaces all virtual net metering, that net metering truly is on-site offsetting on-site on load. Um, and encourage that to the extent possible through price signals. Also needs, one of the concerns I have with the bill is adders for specific groups. And this just gets to the general idea of, um, yes, you can pull different levers to effectuate social policy. I'm not sure that that's always the best thing to do in the electric sector, because every time you are benefiting one group, you're shifting costs to all everybody else to benefit that one particular group. Should social policy instead be targeted towards, let's have as affordable an electric sector as reasonably possible while achieving all GHG requirements and renewable goals. And then um, that can actually benefit a much broader range of people than, okay, we have a program that's gonna benefit couple hundred customers and everybody else pays for the benefit to that couple hundred customers. That's my concern whenever you have adders, things like that. Last thing, um, this is when uh, Ledge Council talked about, mentioned avoided cost. Uh, she mentioned that there's a definition of avoided cost already in this chapter of Title 30. My concern is that definition of avoided cost is drastically different than the um, industry definition of avoided cost. So avoided cost is something that's been around for a while. PERPA really codified it, basically saying, what is the cost to electric customers of building the next unit of generation? And therefore set the price paid to that PERPA qualifying facility based on the cost of the utility to build or contract for that next unit to build. Um, so it's essentially PERPA's set up in a way to essentially provide competition uh, to incumbent utilities and also to, uh, it's, it's also a ratepayer protection as well. Standard offer definition of avoided cost is much more focused on what is the cost to the developer of building that project and ensure that the developer gets at a minimum that cost. That's again, getting back to the ratepayer risk. Um, that's a fundamental concern from the department. Part of deregulation in other states is to shift cost from Vermont captive or from captive electric customers to merchant generators who have both upside potential and downside potential as well. And think, yep. for the purposes of the bill, um, we're talking more like a purple like definition. So the lowest cost additional unit of power of a particular nature, like renewable. Um, so that, yeah, comparable power purchased on the marketplace. Yep. And and that was my understanding, but there is, it's not explicit. And the fact yeah. that Ledge Council had noted that, which is understandable, um, had reference back to the standard offer definition of avoided cost, uh, gave me a little bit of pause and I just wanted to flag that, so. Okay, thank you. And that was the end. The last thing I note is that <clears throat> every year we provide you an annual energy report. 
Um, also included in that is an appendix on renewable energy programs, uh, standard offer, net metering, <clears throat> um, Rygate, you know, others. And then we also, this year, every two years, we provide a report on net metering. So those are submitted, those are submitted under the annual energy report, and there is a link in the presentation to that report. Great. Um, that report has become a more and more helpful tool to the committee. I think we looked at it back when we started the session, which feels like about 18 months ago at this point. Um, Senator McDonald, last question to you uh, I, I, before we go on to Ms. Richards. Um, yes, I'm, I have a conflict of interest. I have uh, a net meter. I have an electric car, both of which I, I entered into with the notion of dealing with climate change and not getting rich. Um, so I'm annoyed when I you know, invest in that and then the rules are changed and I'm, I want to know why I'm getting treated differently than other people at net meter. Um, and I'm, my questions have been to look beyond those, my attempt to look beyond those things and to deal with our, our policy. Um, if we're charged with the industry with avoided costs and we watch in the newspaper um, or in journals about how banks, um, insurance companies and other investors are writing off their 40 year investments in fossil fuel use and seeking to close down plants um, and not build more fossil fuel plants because they are bad investments. Um, how do we spur wiser investments um, and get out of fossil fuels when electric utility buyers are buying stuff like net by natural gas and great sunk great units to continue to use fossil fuels um, you've given us some advice in uh, the section uh, can't keep track of my notes so maybe I've got to stop and let the next next person go along um, in your notes of things not to do. And when I find it, I'll, I'll maybe ask later. But that's that's my goal. And I think that's the committee's goal and not to simply pass the bill that some of us have our names on, but to, to chart a wise course for the greater goals. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator McDonald. Uh, Senator Westman, I know that you have a question and I know that you have another obligation. So I'm just trying to make sure you... Uh, I, I was going to say I do have another another obligation. I have a, um, a heater in an apartment that's died, and later in the week it's going to. I just wanted to say to Mr. McNamara, um, your big picture has been very helpful. We have a lot of people that come in and they see their piece of it, but it's not the big picture. And this, the big picture, has been quite helpful for me to lay the groundwork. Um, um, to think about this in a, um, in a, a, a better way. Okay, appreciate that. Okay. And your, your storage mandates is what I couldn't find, which was useful and to picture things. Thank you. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. McNamara. And, and uh, committee, if you have not checked out that um, annual energy report, it is, uh, there's a lot of it's a lot like what I think the author of that report is in the room right now. And so um, the, the same quality presentation we just got is in the report. Um, the, and with that, I'd like to turn to um, Ms. Richards. So um, for one, thank you for the Patient Witness of the Year Award. Um, <laughs> I did Thank make you. it for 8.30. <laughs> yeah. uh, so thanks for hanging in there. And um, we'd love to hear what the Washington Electric Co-op perspective is on, on the issue. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure joining you. Um, for the record, Patty Richards, I'm the general manager here at Washington Electric Co-op. I do have a PowerPoint that I'll put up just to help, uh, um, help me go through the talking points, I can figure out how to share, just bear with me. Um, 
share. You should be seeing a PowerPoint now, and I'm happy to make that bigger or smaller, depending on what you see on your screens. Um, looks good to me. I'm not okay. sure for other folks. So I'm just gonna go uh, through this PowerPoint um, and would love to make this a conversation and uh, you know, talk through with you guys uh, any questions you have about what we're doing at Washington Electric Hall. Um, so page down. So this is just a, a, a chart you've seen before about Washington Electric Co-op. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this other than as a co-op, we are accountable to our member owners and they tell us what we are to do. Um, we're a little different than other utilities in that regard. Um, our member owners have supported a policy of being coming 100% renewable. And in fact, we are 100% renewable. And I'll have a slide in terms of where our resources come from specifically. And 85% of that power supply mix that's renewable is in the state of Vermont. So it's both renewable and mostly local. Um, this is a chart, a pie chart, to show you where our power supply came from in the year 2020. Uh, just looking back at the past year, we have roughly three quarters, 71% of our power comes from the Coventry landfill gas plant or, or landfill gas facility. This takes methane coming off the landfill and instead of letting that methane either be flared or seeping into the environment, we burn that methane in Caterpillar engines and make electricity. That's the lion's share of our energy mix. It's an eight megawatt landfill gas burner. Um, we also have a slice of the Sheffield Wind Project. We get roughly four megawatts from that facility. We own um, our own hydro facility, the Wrightsville Hydro Plant, small hydro plant, uh, just under a megawatt. And we, that produces about 3% of our energy needs. We have a slice of the Rygate Wood Facility. And then the only other power facility that we take substantial power from is New York Power Authority, which is a large hydro facility. And I just put up here a note that we do not have any Hydro-Quebec power in our power supply mix. Earlier witnesses were um, you know, indicating that HQ is bad. I'm not going to opine on the good or the bad of HQ. I just want to note in our 2020 power mix, we do not have Hydro-Quebec power. Um, so that's just rounding out where our resources come from. Um, now I'm going to go to specifically the committee's questions that you asked of us. And I've literally put the questions up on a slide and I'm going to try to answer them as I go. So you asked, how would your organization define Vermont's renewable energy, energy generation challenges? Um, from WEC's standpoint, uh, we get it. We're already there. We've decided this well and long before any uh, policy um, mandates were requested to become renewable. Our our board of directors are members of the co-op and it was their mission to push us ahead many years ago to become 100% renewable. We did that on behalf of our members. Um, in terms of climate change, we get it too. Climate change is real. We feel that that's an, a, a paramount issue that as a society and as a human uh, race, we have to address. Um, we're already paying for climate change. And I like to tell people that in the sense that it's not if we're going to pay, but every time we have a mega storm roll in or catastrophic event, you know, even a small event that creates a significant cost in terms of the Emerald Ash Borer, climate change is causing cost already to utilities in all our all Vermonters across the land in terms of how we operate, how we function. The real dollars are being spent on that. We do believe that climate change requires bold action and we have to be brave about this. We absolutely get that. We support many of the programs that the state has initiated. Um, the thing that I will, you're gonna hear me harp on is that while we support many of these initiatives, we also have to keep in mind and be conscious of the affordability aspect. Um, some of the programs are expensive and we point that out whether that's a good thing or bad thing, that's up for others to decide, but we think it's important to be very clear about what the programs end up costing. Um, our big challenge long-term is 
you know, obviously we already get that climate change is real and we've taken actions to make our renewable power supply mix 100% renewable, but we also have to remain relevant and competitive. So when I say that, what I mean by that is just because it's renewable doesn't mean it's necessarily good for the WEC membership. We want to pursue renewables that are affordable. And I know I have options and things that I can do that are much cheaper than buying, you know, a, another particular renewable resource. I'm going to go to the one that's the least expensive because that's good for my membership. We need to remain competitive. And the other, the other piece that we're very mindful of is the more cost that we, we layer on top of the utilities that does translate directly into higher rates. Um, some of the witnesses have described the, the higher rates in pennies. And I will argue against that as an economist myself, it's not pennies, it's dollars and these are real dollars. We have members that can't afford to pay their bill already. And if I slap another six, $7 on their bill per month, it just it becomes a tipping point for some of our consumers. So I'm very conscious of that issue. I'll get into some specifics on what I mean by that in a couple of slides. Um, also, another challenge for how we perceive renewables is location matters. Uh, you've all heard that there's a transmission bottleneck uh, constraints in the northern part of the state, and it's been dubbed the Shiite issue. WEC has three quarters of its power supply mix being Sheffield Wind and the Coventry landfill plant located, it's actually more than three quarters, it's like 80%, 85% of our um, portfolios inside the Shiite. We have lost already from just um, depressed uh, energy payments from the ISO New England, roughly $500,000. To WEC, that's a big number. Um, you know, that's in the three to 4% rate impact number. So we are already seeing uh, new generation and pressure in that area make our power that's already renewable worth less. It's having an impact. We need to balance locationally where new uh, renewable generation or other generation is being constructed. Okay. Um, Ms. Uh, Richards, the 500,000, is that an annual cost um, or is that a cumulative cost since the curtailment started to happen or? That's a cumulative cost from 2016 through 2020. It's a good question. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um, in terms of the question is uh, in terms of the tier two program, and its cost effectiveness. Tier two, as we all know, is the net metering program for small, for small net metering and small I refer to as less than 500 kW. Uh, from WEC standpoint, this is not a least cost solution. We are paying more for the net metering energy that's produced than what we could do as alternatives. And what I mean as an alternative is I could expand the Coventry landfill project produce a base load renewable power, um, you know, add to a base load renewable power and produce energy 24 seven. So this gets to Senator McDonald's question of how do we produce solar at night when it's dark? I would argue, how do we produce renewable energy when it's dark? And you wanna have a yep. diversified portfolio yep. to do that. I can build for five cents at Coventry. Instead, I'm paying 18 to 19 cents for net metering facilities that are a lot less effective. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do and incentivize net metering. I'm just saying that the, the scale and the width of how much we're incentivizing is causing cost pressure. So if I look at the alternative where I could build it for five cents, is that not a better solution if I'm purely looking at the economics? I think there is some value in having diversity in the power and the portfolio mix and the new things that we do. But I don't think it should be such a gap in terms of how much we have to spend today for those net metering facilities. We have lost, and this is an annual number, this is where we are as of today, we are up to $736,000 
of lost dollars. This is netting after we pay out for the net metering, we subtract off um, that expense, what we're saving. And we're, we've accumulated $736,000 of a deficit. That's a 5.3% rate increase. That's $6 a month. Some would argue, well, that's not a lot of money, Patty, a month. But I have other customers that do argue that is a lot of money. They're looking at $6 a month for net metering. They're looking at another $6 a month for their efficiency Vermont charge. And then they're looking at their underlying power bill. Eventually, this stuff starts to really layer and pancake up. People are having difficulty paying their bills. In WEX situation, we are a 16 megawatt utility. We currently have deployed uh, for customer owned generation five megawatts. The numbers are substantial. Um, on an energy basis, we're at 5.6% of our uh, power supply mix being produced by solar facilities, uh, net metered solar facilities. We would argue that there are other ways to accomplish renewable goals. We do think that the state should look at allowing utilities to build instead of the small stuff, but allow us to build a larger project to accomplish state goals. And in that way, we can take advantage of economies of scale. If I'm required to actually have solar in my power supply mix, I can do that between 10 and 12 cents as an electric utility. So why, is, why wouldn't we do that instead of spending 18 cents for a bunch of solar sprinkled all across our service territory um, in a scattered and potentially haphazard way? If I can locate that solar where it makes sense in my system in one injection point, that's actually better for the grid. And we can do that for a much cheaper cost point, that's better for our membership. So I'd argue there's <laughs> different ways to accomplish the same goals of bringing on more solar, but doing it in a way that makes it more affordable. And the other thing that I really wanna stress is that those people now that are putting solar, and I'm not gonna say, I should say other people. Many, many of our members feel folks that are building solar are those that are the most wealthy in our service territory. And I've heard repeatedly, why should I pay for my neighbor's solar facility? We have a Robin Hood effect going on in a reverse <laughs> way. Because we have cross subsidization, we have expenses coming from the net metering program that are being borne by the rest of the membership. And we have some very um, income sensitive members that are paying for this program that we could do in an alternative way that's less expensive. This reverse Robin Hood um, situation, if we continue to grow net metering, is just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. Instead of $6 a month, if this number doubles, we're looking at $12 a month. These are significant cost numbers. We would like to see more equity. We'd like to see it done on a more cost-effective basis. The next question is, is it to address energy burden and social inequity by developing renewable energy for low-income Vermonters? Again, I argue cost matters. Uh, low-income folks are generally, right now for the state's programs, they're most impacted and they have the least voice. And we think we can accomplish the state's goals with less negative impact by doing things differently. Let us build projects, if you wanna give us a mandate, give us the mandate, but let us build the project and take advantage of economies of scale and let us build renewables and not sole source it to a singular, singular type of renewable. Let us maximize what efficiencies we have in our system. If we can expand an existing facility and accomplish renewable goals, we should do that and allow that to happen at a least cost, a lower cost that brings in more renewables and keeps our costs in check. Another question that was asked is, is it to sustain the state's workers in our clean energy economy? WEC certainly agrees that jobs are important. But we also know that electricity rates are important. If my electricity rates get so high, I'm going to discourage business from either locating in my service territory or expanding in my service territory. So as electricity rates grow, that becomes job suppression. 
So jobs do matter and, and you can look at that in several different ways. Who should own these new assets and finance them? We would argue that ownership and finance structures should remain, should remain flexible and not prescriptive. Um, as witness uh, Ed McNamara stated, if there's a policy goal that you'd like to put forward, keep it general and then let us figure out the best way to accomplish that policy, a goal and that, that um, that framework based on, the, based on the tools we have at our disposal. For example, WEC as a cooperative utility, we can borrow low interest loans from the federal government through Rural Utility Services or RUS. That's a specific um, benefit that we have available to us that other utilities in the state do not. So if you, if you become too prescriptive in terms of ownership and financing, you potentially lose out on a tool that we have available to us in terms of our low interest, our US financing. So keeping things in general, in terms of policy is really important to advance the least cost path forward. Um, ownership and financing, I, you know, WEC does own facilities and I don't think that there should be a mandate that it should be a specific type of ownership. I think that should be the sky is the limit in terms of how we do these types of programs. Your next question is, will utilities put out RFPs or own their generation or some sort of mix? And I would say yes to both of those. And in fact, we have uh, power contracts with Sheffield Wind. We were um, an integral part of getting that project developed. We uh, front ended a million dollars to the developer. So we were creative in our space and how that Sheffield Wind project came to fruition. And we used both a combination of pre-funding, the pre-development aspect and the permitting and all the other expenses that go into developing. And on the back end of it, rather than own the facility and manage it, we said we would like a purchase power contract for that. That mixture of both resulted in the project moving forward. So again, allowing us to be creative is really important. Uh, outside of net metering, what opportunities are there for developers to lead on renewable generation and to what scale do we want to build such facilities? Again, I'm, I'm gonna hit the same note again, where we would seek policies and legislation that allow us to continue to be creative. I think the sky is the limit and things that we can do. And if there's a mandate of becoming more renewable or a, a certain target of renewable renewability, that's sufficient for us to do the work that we need to do and then let us be creative in terms of who owns it, who's developing it and how that plays out so that we can get the best value on the table for our members and for the Vermont consumers on the electric rates. And with that, th those are my prepared comments and I'm happy to open it up to questions. Great, well, thank you to you for um, preparing and uh, patients in terms of us getting to you. For a couple minutes over, I'd like to ask one quick question. Uh, you know, sometimes I wonder for a utility that's in your position, namely 100% renewable already, um, do you, how do you think about, I mean, I could imagine someone saying, wait, we're, we already, we ran the race, we crossed the finish line, um, you know, we're good, leave us out of your machinations in the legislature. Oh, and so how do you how do you think about that you know like where will you go next kind of a thing and how do you make those choices once a utility becomes in its entire system 100 percent renewable i think there certainly should be rewards for those utilities that do things that don't require a policy mandate so in the event we've already reached the policy mandate that is being put forward, you know, if it's to become 100% renewable, if we've already met that, then I think that we should get a pass. If there's a specific mandate that says we want to see every utility have 10% of its power mix come from solar, that's like a different, that's a different um, goal to take on. It's specific to a very individual technology. I'm not saying I support that, but right. if that becomes the mandate, 
then all of a sudden I can justify a need for that solar. And then I would go forth and build that solar at the least cost way in the, in the least expensive way I can do that and bring yeah. solar to our members. Okay, great, all right. So any final questions to Ms. Richards this morning? Okay. Um, and, uh, would would Ms. Richards stay on Senator when we Ka go off? I, I had a couple, I'd like to chat with her for a moment. <laughs> Okay. Happy to. Um, okay. All right. So I want to thank all our uh, guests this morning and the committee for persevering in the light of another uh, trip down the the energy buffet table, loading our plates uh, many times over. I'd say. Um, okay. When with that we are adjourned. Uh, we meet tomorrow Thursday at starting at nine a.m. Uh, Senator McDonald and I have Elkar. Excellent morning, Mr. You, Chair. We, we, excellent morning. We learned a, a lot of, about the, the, um, the landscape today that, that was helpful, so. Yeah, I, I'd say <laughs> we're in that um, investing and learning phase, which is a little tricky because it's taxing and the answers are still eluding us, you know, but um, I do feel like everyone is very interested in coming out the other side of the learning curve with something useful. <laughs> so, all right, uh, I'm going to sign off so you and Ms. Richards yeah. can have your. <laughs>